Well, take your Bibles and open up with me to John chapter 20, okay? We're going to come back and engage at the time of worship here in about 30 minutes or so around the Lord's table, so we'll get a chance to sing some more. But take your Bibles and open up with me to John 20, and I will be speaking from John 10 this morning, but I just want to introduce you to it by way of coming at it from the 20th chapter of John, because it's helpful to remember um, why it is that the Gospel of John was written for us. And John gives us that very clearly in the 20th chapter, down about verse 30. So I'm coming back to John 10 in a second, but just notice for me, if you would, John 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. That's right, he did a lot of miracles. Only nine of them are recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe, here it comes, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So one of the things, one of the reasons that the Gospel of John was recorded for us is so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, just by qualification here, when you and I say Son of God, we need to remember how they would have thought about it in biblical times. That is, they would have thought about it with two words, authority and identity. That when someone said they were the son of someone, that meant that they had the authority of their father. And it was identity as well. That means that they had the identity of their father. Now, if you you can think back to your dad, um, there's certain times I'll do something or I'll hold my hands a certain way and Kim will say to me, you just look like your dad. Right there, you just looked exactly like your dad. Um, She says the same thing of my 19-year-old son and believe it or not, even my 11-year-old son when he starts talking does certain things just the way that dad did them right? Okay. And I never even really asked them to do those things. Just being around, they kind of pick that up. So there is in the, in the understanding of the Son of God, not only the authority of the Son of God that Jesus fully is God, but the identity of the Son of God that Jesus fully is God. And let me show you that in the Gospel of John. Go back with me to John chapter 10, if you will. And just let me show you why in this passage this morning, that is what's at stake. Okay. Probably nowhere else is the deity of Christ so clearly expressed by Christ. And the response is what we are typically coming to see when the Jews, that is the religious leaders of the day, respond to him. Jesus said in verse 30, John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. Very clearly an expression of I am God. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Why? Because Not because he said he was one with the Father, but because they recognized that he was saying, I am God. A little later in verse 38, Jesus said, you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. Every time Jesus gets specific about his deity, they attempt to kill him and Jesus never corrects them. He never says, oh, oh, you misunderstood me. Instead, he simply steps back because he knows what's coming, and ultimately, it will end up with his crucifixion. So I kind of qualify that for you in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. Now, just read the passage with me. Oh, let me show you one other thing, if I could. The whole gospel of John does this, and sometimes it's helpful to see the beginning of a book and the end of the book. So here's how it starts, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, referencing Jesus Christ by the term logos, or the Word here, Jesus was God. God. That's what the scripture is saying. A little later, at the end of the chapter, at the end of the book, this is what we read. When Thomas is confronted by the risen Christ, eight days later, his disciples were in sight again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he goes that whole ordeal of, uh, see my wounds. But here's what Thomas says. Thomas answered him and said, just say it with me, my Lord and... Yeah. Thomas is saying, I recognize you to be God. So from the beginning of John to the end of John, people affirm that Jesus is God. And that's exactly what's happening. So now just follow with me as we begin reading in John chapter 10, verse 22. At the time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. It's literally in the outside area of the temple where the columns were. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, by way of clarification, when you see Christos, Greek, the Christ, that's the Greek word for the word Messiah. So they're saying, Are you the Messiah? Are you from God? 
And Jesus answered them, verse 25, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So just know this, the religious leaders got it, okay? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? Let me stop there for a second and explain a thought to you, okay? Um, It almost sounds like Jesus is downplaying that idea of the son of God, right? That he is saying, um, listen, we're all sons of God, okay? And it is true that we're all children of God when we placed our faith in Christ, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. Okay? He quotes a passage from the Psalms, and the ESV Study Bible kind of references it. It says, Jesus' point in quoting Psalm 82, 6 is that human judges can in some sense be called gods in light of their role as representatives of God. It's talking about judges back there. This designation is even more appropriate for the one who truly is the Son of God. So Jesus says, listen, you even acknowledge that there are those who are representatives from God back in the Psalms, and you all acknowledge that, Right? Where, wherefore there is your hang up with me if I am truly the son of God and I claim to be God. And I'll keep reading, verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand. Another way to translate that is that you may really, really understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. And again, they sought to arrest him but he escaped from their hands. And finally, verse 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So here's your idea. Jesus articulates that he fully is God. And that has some wonderful application points for all of us. Here's the first one. Okay? This is why our security is in Christ and not in another. This is why our security is in Christ and not in our finances. This is why our security is in Christ and not in our circumstances. Our security is in Christ because Jesus, being God, he doesn't change his answers based upon the op- opinion of others. He doesn't change his answers based upon the opinion of others. Now, I don't know if you've ever, um, if you've ever put your security or confidence in a person, another person, And at some stage, they said to you something like, yeah, I just changed my mind, okay? And you said, whoa, whoa, how did you change your mind? And before long, you discovered that they changed their mind because somebody else had a different opinion and they were attempting to satisfy that opinion. Here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus doesn't change his mind based upon other people's opinions of him. In fact, throughout all the Gospel of John, over and over again, they're pressuring him, we're gonna stone you, we're gonna execute you, we're gonna arrest you, we're gonna capture you, we're gonna beat you up, we're gonna do all of this. And all throughout all of it, Jesus maintains what he said from the beginning. Why? Because being God, he has no need to change his mind. He answers not based upon the opinion of others. And you see that, again, here in verse... um, here in, here in verse 20, 25, for there we read, Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. He said, I've already told you this. And of course, their response is to verse 31, pick up stones again to stone him. Their response is verse 39, after that they sought to arrest him. But Jesus doesn't change his position. And so there's great comfort in that. Here's your second idea. Um, being God... Being God, he keeps his promises and cannot lie. I love this, okay? Being God, he keeps his promises and cannot lie. Now, um, let me just ask a question. How many of you would acknowledge at some stage in your life you either told a lie 
or you held back something that gave a better impression, in other words, you told a lie by your silence, okay? How many of you acknowledge that at least at some stage in your life you've done that? Can I see your hands? Okay. Wow, a lot of honest people and the others, you can now raise your hands because you've done it too, okay? You've done it too. The point of the matter is this. Our minds kind of work like that. We think, if I say that, I'm, is that going to get me in trouble, right? Maybe I shouldn't say that. And, and we are prone this way because our character is not fully as God's, okay? But I love this. T just take a... Just take a look at, at this passage. Um, just take a look with me at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Because if Jesus fully is God, that's got an incredible application for us. And here it is. Hebrews chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 18. So Jesus, while he is fully man, is not like us in this regard because he's fully God. Notice it. So that by two unchangeable things, here it comes, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Just let that thought settle in, okay? Is it possible for God to lie? Answer yes or no. No. Is it impossible for God to lie? Answer yes or no. Yes, it's impossible for God to lie. Do you see this? Being God, he keeps his promises and cannot lie because his promise is tied to his character. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as the forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here's all I want you to see. All of that is possible because it is impossible for Jesus to lie. Okay? It's a great truth. In fact, it should give us hope. It should give us security that if Jesus said it, He's not changing his mind. And secondly, just on the opinion of others, and secondly, we can have this incredible hope that he is telling us the truth. Let me give you another idea that goes with that. Here it is. Being God, he can do on our behalf what no one else can do. Okay? Because Jesus Christ is God, he can do on our behalf what no one else can do. And that brings us to a great section of verses that I just want to camp out on here for about eight or ten minutes. I want you to see these. Go back with me again to this passage. Um, chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. Okay? Because we call this what I'm going to call salvation security. Sometimes you may have heard this phrase used as eternal security. It's actually based on a string of phrases that we find in this passage. Well, it's based throughout the scripture, but here it's really specific, okay? Jesus says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Then he says, I and my father are one. So there are these great lessons that we learn that kind of tap for us the eternal nature, the eternal security that we can have once we are saved. And just, let me see if I can bring that all home. Of all the reasons why you want to come to Christ for your security, this is the most important one. Okay? Because if what happens on the other side of the grave is tied to whether or not you can believe Jesus, okay, this is really, really, really important. Now, some of you may have grown up in a church that taught that, well, listen, you can, you can get saved, but then if you fall away, you got to get saved again, because after all, you weren't walking with the Lord in that process. Just let me see if I can clarify that with a couple of ideas, okay? The Bible teaches that if you are saved according to this passage, you are eternally saved, okay? Now, you say, well, Phil... I'm struggling with that because I know of this guy who looked to make a commitment, okay? And then he made a commitment, but man, or this woman, but they are not following the Lord at all. They're actually doing the very things that God said they shouldn't do, okay? There's two thoughts I have in that. The first one is this, that we certainly are not perfect when we come to Christ, but we would not be happy with that condition when we came to Christ, right? We would still struggle. So if someone says, Forget all of that. I know I made a decision, but I don't really care about that anymore. This is my life. This is who I am. Okay. Then I would never, 
out of that position give that person the assurance of their salvation. You say, Phil, I thought you just said that they couldn't lose their salvation. That's correct. But even 1 Corinthians 5 says, with a man who is involved in immorality, it says, when you address him, address him as a so-called brother. That is, as a brother in name only. Don't assume that he's a genuine brother, right? Because he is rejoicing in his lifestyle and in his sin. So that brings a wonderful point of conviction to us. What are we doing with our sin? Are we repenting from it? Are we turning from it? And if I could use a metaphor that's actually used here, okay? Um, Note this, that we are referred to as what kind of animal in this passage, John chapter 10? What kind of animal? Sheep, okay? We're referred to as sheep. We are not referred to as other barn animals, okay? Like, give me another barn animal. A pig, okay? That's right. It doesn't refer to us as the pigs of God, it refers to us as the sheep of God, right? Why does it refer to us in that way? Well, because a sheep will do things that a pig won't do. Now, I know this because I grew up on a farm years ago, and my dad, uh, when I was like Ace's age, my dad came home and couldn't find out why all, he'd go to, he was a farmer, and he, he was also a school teacher, so he'd go to school. I'd get home from school earlier than him. I was about eight or nine years old, 10 years old, and I would come home, from work and I, from school rather, and I thought I was the farmer, right? So every time my dad came home, all the animals were out of the pens, right? And he'd have to round them up and he said, how in the world are they getting out of the pens? And then one day he watched, he got home early enough to watch me and reportedly I went and just started open up the gates, right? And the animals started moving all over. They just went wherever they wanted to go because I thought I was little farmer Phil, okay? So that's the picture, right? I didn't understand that my father kept those animals separate, okay? But I will tell you that when I did that with the pigs, you know where the pigs went? Right to the mud, okay? When I did that with the sheep, you know where the sheep went? Anywhere but to the mud, okay? This is really an interesting idea. The sheep don't crawl down in the mud. They gotta be clean when they get up against briars and stuff, but they don't get in the mire like a pig does, okay? You can wash a pig until he smells like bacon. No, no, no. You can wash a pig until, I don't know where that came from, until he smells perfect, right? You open the gate, you know where that pig's going to go? Even First Peter confirms this, right back to the mud, okay? Because he's not a sheep. He's a what? A pig. This is the picture of this metaphor, that if you are truly saved, yes, it will affect how you live. It will affect how you live. But if you are truly saved, listen, your salvation is not tied to the fact that you've got to do all of these good works to please God so that he lets you into heaven. Your salvation is not tied to that, okay? Your salvation is tied to the fact, well, I'll give them to you. Here they are. Four things found in this passage. Let me give a a real quick point of qualification here. Warren Wiersbe adds this thought. He says, from the human standpoint, we become a sheep by believing But from the divine standpoint, we believe because we are sheep. There is a mystery here that we cannot fathom or explain, but we can accept it and rejoice. God has his sheep and his sheep and his sheep, and he knows who they are. They will hear his voice and respond. Part of the argument that is legitimate for the fact that we um, are Christ and our salvation is secure, part of the argument um, is this, that, that because... Christ chose us and we didn't choose him, we can't de-choose ourselves. So that's part of this argument that we find here. Jesus said, you're not my sheep, but these are my sheep, and that's why they hear my voice. Let me give you four truths. Here they are real quickly. The four reasons why our salvation is secure in Christ is because of the grace of God, the life of God, the promise of God, the power of God, okay? Just say those with me. The grace of God, the life of God, the promise of God, the power of God. One more time. The grace of God, the life of God, the promise of God, the power of God. Notice what Jesus says in verse 28. I give them eternal life. He doesn't say they've earned it, okay? He says I gave it. You and I came to Christ not because of anything we've done, So our security is not in what we've done, it's in what Christ has done. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. I give them eternal life, they will never perish. In fact, um, I'm just reminded of that uh, in this verse. Just hear it again with me. For by grace you have been saved. Well, turn there with me because even though you may have heard it, not everybody has. And I want you to see it in the text. So go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. 
Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. Ephesians two, verse eight. For when you see the word grace in the scriptures, it means the word gift, okay? Chapter two, verse eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. Just see the next phrase. It is the what? The gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This wonderful reminder that what we have received is of the grace of God. And that's why Jesus uses the same idea when he says, I give them eternal life. They didn't earn it, okay? I gave it to them. The grace of God is one of the reasons why our salvation is secure. Here's the second idea, the life of God. The life of God, something eternal cannot be lost or overturned. And I just think about this for a second. The nature of the word, he says, I give them, what? Eternal life. The nature of eternal is that it can't be uneternal. Okay? I, I don't mean to make it sound overly simple, but it is. The nature of eternal is that it's eternal. Okay? You, you can't overturn something that's eternal. It can't, it can't be temporary. It's eternal. Therefore, Jesus says, listen, I give them eternal life. It's not something I gave them and that they lose. It's not something I gave them and it gets overturned. It is eternal. By the way, this is tied to the character of God. I, I was thinking about this. Um, I was thinking about this because um, <clears throat> when, when I think of something that is, I can't, let me, let me cover that at the next point, actually, the promise of God. Um, because that's, that, that covers it. So let me just catch it there. The life of God is something that is eternal, cannot be lost or overturned. So when God gave us, through Jesus, eternal life, it means that it isn't a temporary life, it isn't a temporal life, it isn't I changed my mind life, it's eternal life. Here's the second idea. The promise of God, never perish is tied to God's character. Now we've already said this, right? That Jesus, because he is God, it is impossible for him to lie. So when he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish, the promise is tied to his character. And that's shown to us over in the book of Titus. Titus chapter one. Titus chapter one, verse two. Just let me read you that verse. There we read. In hope of eternal life, there's your idea, which God, who never lies, there it is, promised before the ages of again. I, I love that. Your eternal life through Christ can't be changed because God made a promise and God never lies. In fact, I was thinking of that, how different that is and how thankful I am that Jesus is God because we can actually say when Jesus says, they'll never perish, we will never perish. Let me see if I can explain another way. Okay. Um, a number of years ago, we were out to... Uh, we were out west, and we visited Mount Rushmore. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Mount Rushmore, but um, when you're there, the, the guy who actually designed Mount Rushmore, a guy by the name of Gutzen Borglum, he actually said, listen, we're going to cut this thing out of granite because, therefore, thousands of years from now, okay, if America ceases to be, <clears throat> they're still going to know that there was this great nation here. So when I read that by him, and I'm looking at these massive faces carved in the granite, they're like 60 meters tall or whatever. I remember looking at that thinking, wow, can you imagine like one day everything's all overgrown? Okay. This is a guy who thought that the American experiment would one day, I guess, fail. So it's all overgrown. Whatever happens out to Mount Rushmore, the National Park shut down. Somebody's just hiking and they bump up against Abraham Lincoln's nose. Okay. And they pull it back and they say, wow, there must have been something else here. You say, what does that have to do with this? A lot. Here's why. You and I have no promises that we can make as people that can exist beyond our life. Okay? We don't, right? We, can't, we can make a promise. We can try to invest something for our kids, but we have no promise that upon our death that all of the things we promised them could actually come to fruition. We can't even keep the promise when we're here, but we certainly can't keep it when we're dead. Okay? This is beautiful. Jesus' promise, they will never perish, is tied to the fact that he would never perish. Are you with me? Because he indeed is God from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 92 says he can actually keep this promise. We will never perish. I love that. The promise is tied to eternal life and he makes the promise. 
It's beautiful. There's one more, and here it is. The power of God. He goes on to say this. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. Well, let me back up. The end of verse 28, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, whenever you read about the hand or the arm of God in the scripture, it's speaking of strength, that God's arm is mighty and none can turn it. It's speaking of strength. I have, I have this great memory of, uh, of my dad, and it was kind of like one of those epiphanal moments. We were on a fishing trip out west that we did for his 80th birthday, and he got down the bank, and he was fishing down there, and, and he called for help, right? And I came to help him. And I was up on the bank, probably a distance about like this, and he said, hey, I just need a hand to get up out of here. And I reached for him. And right when I reached for him and felt his hand, um, I realized that it was the strength of my hand that was actually pulling him up out of there, right? My father, who had been a strong man, was 80 years old, and so he didn't have the same strength in his hand. And I remember as I'm pulling him up, all of these thoughts are like slamming through my head, like in the few seconds it took to get him up the bank. I'm pulling and I'm thinking, I'm the one who's actually pulling here. And it was like I could almost feel the reversal of that. Like there I was as a little seven-year-old saying, hey, Dad, Dad, can you get me up from the riverbank? And my dad was reaching for me with the strength of his hand. Right? Here's what I want you to always remember. Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hand, which means that when you have been saved, no hand is stronger than Christ's hand. But then he says, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's almost like the Son's hand and the Father's hand create for you the security that by their power, no one is stronger, right? No one is stronger. Your thoughts aren't stronger. The person who tells you things about you is not stronger. In fact, Satan himself isn't stronger, right? The strength of the Father's hand and the Son's hand is such that we are reminded that our salvation is secure. I love that image. In fact, I love the way that A.W. Pink captured it. He said this. Can you guys just advance that slide for me if you could real quickly? Here's what he said. The believer is in the hands of Christ and none is able to pluck them out. Tease and annoy him, the devil may, but seize the believer he cannot. Blessed, comforting, and reassuring truth this is. Weak and helpless in himself, nevertheless, the sheep is secure in the hands of the shepherd. Right? That's a great statement. So, are you tempted? Are you doubting? All of that may be accurate. But if you have fully placed your trust in Christ, if you are following him, repenting as God gives opportunity, the Holy Spirit reveals to you the things that are going on in your life that are wrong. If you are doing that, no one can take you out of the hand of Christ. This morning, in a moment, we're going to embrace that again when we worship around the Lord's table or enjoy those elements together. I just want to remind you of something, a great truth in this, that what Jesus did in pouring out his life and his, his very blood for us actually won this victory for us. This is not based upon what you and I do. This is based upon what Christ has done.